welcome back. Human rights, always an issue of contention and controversy. Why is this? Has fighting the war for the last 30 years made us defensive about human rights violations or worse, dismissive? Is intolerance a growing epidemic in Sri Lanka? I spoke with human rights lawyer Dr. Mario Gomez to talk about the country's handling of the issue in the past and what needs to change in the future. Hello Mario, thanks for joining me on the program. Let me start by asking you straight away, why do you think the issue of human rights is such a controversial topic in Sri Lanka? Well, it's been politicized, I think, during the conflict. Uh, I think on the one hand, uh, you had the sense that the government needed uh, excessive measures and you know, sort of extraordinary measures to be able to deal with the violence of the LTT uh, and also previously with the violence of the JVP. Uh, and so therefore, uh, you know, this whole idea that whenever you talk about human rights, you are not with the state, but you are basically anti-state and you should, uh, you should not be doing that. And so therefore, anyone who used the human rights language became a sort of anti-state animal uh, and, and, and in the recent past was even portrayed as a traitor and, and so on. Uh, more recently, you've had a lot of statements from the West, both from governments as well as Western organizations uh, on human rights and on how the conduct of the war was, was, was done, especially in the last phase. Uh, and so that has also angered government in the sense that here was a government trying to fight what it called a terrorist organization. There was no support from the international community. Uh, all they could do was raise issues of human rights. Uh, and so therefore it was politicized in that sense. But human but, rights extends beyond so much, it's m so much more than just war related um, IDPs and the controversial topics like that. It's so much more than that. Is it that certain topics are more sensitive than others or do we have a flawed understanding of human rights as a whole in Sri Lanka? Well, I think we do have a flawed understanding of human rights. Uh, I think, you know, if you look at some of the human rights issues that pertain to the JVP violence, uh, there you found board institutions like the courts, lawyers um, and, and, and the government as well uh, a little more sensitive to the larger human rights issues of disappearances, accountability, uh, remedial measures for people who lost their spouses and so on. Uh, so if you look at the 94 commissions of inquiry for example, uh, there was a willingness on the part of government to probe accountability uh, during those JVP uh, sort of violence years. Uh, but we've not had a similar measure with inflation to any sort of Tamil based violence. So I think the whole question of ethnicity and the fact that you had um, a fairly ruthless group using violence to, to sort of propagate a sort of, a, a sort of political cause uh, has, has, has resulted in a sort of flawed understanding of human rights, uh, both within government as well as uh, in, uh, in sort of society as well. How can this be addressed? Is it, is law, are laws sufficient or is it more about education? Uh, I think laws are one step, but beyond laws, I think we need uh, institutions. I think at the moment we don't have any institutions that are credible, that operate in a principled way that can advance and protect human rights. Uh, the Human Rights Commission, for example, which has a very good law, very good statute, uh, and can be really quite proactive and dynamic uh, if it wants to, uh, has been a sort of silent spectator uh, through the last couple of years. Uh, so I think one of the problems in Sri Lanka is trying to establish credible, independent, reliable institutions that can protect and promote human rights. Uh, if you look even at the courts, they've played an important role, really. I, I would say the courts are perhaps the only institution that's performed um, uh, reasonably well uh, with regard to human rights. But uh, even the courts now are reluctant to question emergency regulations or to take a stand, a sort of principal stand on human rights. Uh, so one big, big, big sort of deficiency in Sri Lanka, I think, is credible, independent, dynamic institutions. But the, the side the government takes in this debate is that um, national interests are being harmed when you talk about human rights. What do you think about that? Well, we've had this whole national security phobia for many years, I think from the 1970s. We've been governed by emergency laws for, for a large part of the last 35 to 40 years. Uh, and I think, you know, you need emergency laws to cope with an extraordinary situation. You need extraordinary laws for extraordinary violence. Uh, but for governments, it's been easy to sort of uh, govern through emergency regulations. You can use emergency regulations to target your political opponents. You can use it to target exchange control things. There was one moment it, when it was used for educational matters, for, 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 for salt manufacture, you know, and sort of bizarre things like that. Um, so one, one problem is that we've had this whole national security phobia. And that therefore, in an endeavor to protect national security, protect state sovereignty, you should give the government a lot of leeway. Uh, but since the end of the war in, in sort of May 2009, I think we moved away from that. But we are still governed by emergency regulations. So I think we, we, we need to get out of that. 
uh, unfortunately even institutions uh, sometimes give government I think too much leeway uh, with regard to the whole national security issue. But in the past few days we've seen two incidents uh, which broadly um, cover the human rights, um, the freedom of expression issue especially. Um, I'm talking about the proposed and since cancelled visit of um, Akon and also about uh, uh, an author who was jailed for writing two books. Um, what, what do you make of those situations? Well, in the case of Akon, I think the government overreacted. Uh, I think he was an artist. He had perhaps an offensive video. Uh, fair enough, if people did find the offensive, did find the video offensive, yes, you know, you, you can protest, you can engage with, uh, with the artist and so on. Uh, but banning a concert is an extreme reaction. Uh, and I think uh, from a government's perspective, you need to be balanced and proportionate. Uh, here I think the government just went overboard. And I think, you know, trying to tell a performer, an artist, um, not to perform or not to perform his art or, or, or sort of write or, or paint or whatever uh, is akin to a form of censorship. Uh, so I think banning a performance was really an extreme measure. Uh, it was not warranted. I think uh, fine, maybe there were, there were, there were images in, the, in, in, in sort of one of his videos which were offensive. Uh, but then I think the, the, the sort of proper process would have been to engage with him, to either ask him to apologize, uh, to protest at his concert, uh, to, to, to write critical articles in the media about it if you want to express yourself, uh, but not to resort to violence. Uh, and I think that's another facet of this whole episode, the fact that you had a private TV station being attacked by violence. Uh, and I think that's another illustration of the complete breakdown of the rule of law in Sri Lanka. You know, where people can just walk in with impunity, uh, attack a, a sort of private building and then be bailed out in a, in, a, in a few days. Which shows that really we don't have any system of rule of law here. There's no accountability for, for sort of violating the criminal law. So the law is applied selectively. And so long as you're on the right side of the state, uh, you can get away with impunity. Yeah. I think Ekon also illustrates, you know, how perhaps uh, small group uh, can influence public policy and governmental action. Uh, a fairly uh, intense group, uh, a sort of extreme group in a way, uh, who makes decisions about supposed cultural purity, you know, who, who safeguards culture. Culture is a dynamic, fluid concept, it's changing all the time, there are different cultures intermingling, uh, but here the state is arrogating to itself the right to define culture and to define cultural purity. So in the future, how would you like to see people engaging and discussing um, in issues about human rights? Well, at the moment, I think dissent is, is really a fundamental human rights issue. There is really no environment in which one can express any alternative or critical viewpoints. And I think the sort of litmus test of a democracy is how, it, how, how far it goes to protect dissent and to protect peaceful dissent, and, you know, non-violence and so on. Uh, to go back to the Akon incident, um, I think two fundamental principles of Buddhist philosophy are the whole use of non-violence in, in, in the process of uh, uh, engagement uh, and also the idea of compassion and tolerance and the acceptance of diverse views which is also I think intrinsic to Buddhist philosophy. Uh, so fine you may not, you may not agree with Akon and his, and his portrayal of Buddhism in a video but um, uh, I think the correct process then should be to engage with the other. I think what we have now is a very uh, insecure uh, mind on the, on the part of government. I think any, 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 any sort of government that uses violence to suppress dissent uh, is not secure about its own, own views and its own convictions. And so, um, to me, the whole idea of dissent is really a priority in Sri Lanka right now. Uh, we need to be able to peacefully dissent, express our views, whether it's through the arts or whether it's through public television or, or the media.